It's hard to follow that, I think. So, I'm afraid that the title of my remarks that you'll find in the program is, are a little misleading. Um, they might be raising unreasonable, maybe exuberant expectations. The reason for the cherem, as if I'm going to finally reveal the big dark secret. Um, that's not what I'm going to do. Um, as almost everybody in this room knows, is a bit of a mystery behind the cherem. Um, here's what is certain. We do know that by 1656, Spinoza was already engaged deeply in the study of philosophy. We know this from remarks he makes in some of his early published works. We also know this from some things that his friends have said um, in their introductions to his works and in correspondence. So there's the first thing that's certain. By 1656, Spinoza was studying philosophy and moving towards, uh, most likely moving towards his mature, or early versions of his mature philosophical views. The second thing that's certain is that in March of 1656, just a few months before the harem, Spinoza took advantage of Dutch law to relieve himself of debts that he had inherited from his father when his father died and Spinoza took over the family business. Um, he had himself declared an orphan, which was still possible under Dutch law. This relieved him of those debts, and he also uh, promoted himself as a privileged creditor on his father's estate in order to secure his own portion of his mother's inheritance. And by doing this, Spinoza was in flagrant violation of the regulations of the Portuguese Jewish community, which made it very clear that all such disputes, all such financial, economic, and legal disputes are to be managed within the community, not by appealing to Dutch law. So there's a second thing that's certain. The third thing that's certain is that on July of 1656, the Portuguese Jewish community, Talmud Torah, issued the harshest writ of cherem ever pronounced in the 17th century. Speaking of Spinoza's abominable heresies and monstrous deeds, and the cherem was never rescinded. So these three facts are certain. What we do not know for sure is what is the relationship between these three things, between the financial irregularities, the um, philosophical investigations, and the pronouncing of the cherem. It's a mystery on the face of it, because the cherem document does not tell us what the abominable heresies and monstrous deeds were supposed to have been. On the other hand, for anybody who's read Spinoza's mature treatises, there's really not much of a mystery here, especially when we keep in mind that Spinoza began writing those treatises within just a couple of years of the cherem. Uh, and so what I want to do briefly is um, review five major theses of Spinoza's philosophy and things that we have good reasons for thinking were the kinds of things he was saying uh, in the mid-1650s. Before I do that, I want to um, first uh, talk about two other hypotheses about the cherem, because I think it really was a punishment for ideas. Um, some years ago, a very prominent scholar suggested, and this is the first hypothesis, a prominent scholar suggested that this was really a matter of no importance to the Jewish community, a really minor irritant, not something that the community took very seriously. And I think given the, the great deal of effort that the community went to to excommunicate Spinoza, the long list of curses, damnations, the vitriol directed at Spinoza, and the length of the text itself, um, it's clear that the community took this very seriously, whatever it was. This was not a minor irritant, a, a trivial event. The second hypothesis, um, Odette Flessing, who is a prominent Spinoza scholar, suggested that the reasons for the harem, in an article published some years ago, that the reasons for the harem were in fact those financial moves that Spinoza made to relieve himself of debt. And by violating um, the regulations of the community on this economic matter, Spinoza threatened the economic and even the political well-being of the community in the period. And I think she makes a very good and interesting case for this being a particularly aggravating factor in the Spinoza case. However, I don't think that, that those really were the dominant reasons for the harem. The language of the document, I believe, should be taken at face value. Abominable heresies. Moreover, the document forbids anybody to read anything written by Spinoza, suggesting that Spinoza's ideas may have been something that he was seeking to communicate in writing. Um, to, to use that kind of language at such great length suggests very strongly to me that what was at issue here was not the financial affair, but rather a matter of philosophy, a matter of heretical ideas. And we do know that Spinoza 
while he claims in some of his correspondence that he dreaded scandal, we do have good reasons for thinking as well that he was not unwilling to speak openly about his beliefs. So what are those ideas? Um, let me suggest five main theses that perhaps any one of which could have been the truly offending factor, but taken together, they suggest a mind that has deviated far from what any, the leaders of any 17th century Jewish community could have tolerated. Uh, and these are theses that you'll find in Spinoza's uh, philosophical writings, uh, at least perhaps in embryo in 1658 when he's writing his first treatise, uh, and certainly by the mid-1660s when he's at work on the ethics. So the first thesis, uh, the denial of the providential God of Abraham. Spinoza identifies God with nature. And what this means for Spinoza is that there is no such thing as the supernatural. All there is is nature. And he says that everything that exists must exist within, through, and by nature. There are no exceptions to this. So the notion that there could possibly be a providential deity um, a deity who is endowed with the moral and psychological characteristics necessary for exercising the kind of providence that we see in the Bible, that's incoherent. Um, God cannot possibly have the psychological characteristics of expressing hopes, issuing commands, or having expectations upon people. God does not punish or reward individuals. That's the kind of anthropomorphism of God that Spinoza says is a pernicious fiction giving rise to superstitious beliefs. God just is nature. Moreover, God does not have any moral characteristics. It makes no sense to speak of God or nature being good or wise or just. Nature just is, period. And whatever exists in nature doesn't exist for some purpose because God is not some creator who does things for a purpose. Nature has always been and always will be. And everything that happens within nature happens with an absolute necessity by virtue of the laws of nature. There are no exceptions to those laws. Miracles are impossible because miracles would be God violating God because God is just nature. Um, I, <laughs> Spino I think th if there was really an aggravating factor, um, the, the denial of miracles might be uh, something. Uh, Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes was another early modern philosopher who got into a lot of hot water for at least being skeptical about the possibility of miracles. Uh, ordinarily, Spinoza is referred to as a pantheist. I actually think that's a, a somewhat misleading way to think of Spinoza. I think he's an atheist. Uh, because even if a pantheist, will, a pantheist would agree that all there is is nature, but by being a pantheist, the, Spino the, the pantheist will say there's something divine or worshipful about nature. The atheist says, well, yes, I agree with you, all there is is nature, but nature is not something deserving of worshipful awe or religious reverence. Nature is something to be investigated and understood. So I would suggest that if you want to make Spinoza some kind of theist, theist, it has to be an atheist, not a pantheist. So there's the first thesis, his vision of God. Secondly, Spinoza uh, famously denies that scripture, the Bible, is literally authored by God, either by God itself or by dictating these words to some, um, some amanuensis. Um, Spinoza claims, uh, perhaps for the first time in history, that all of scripture is simply a work of human literature, composed by a number of authors over a long period of time, authors who, as the prophets, he says, were not especially well-educated. And therefore, they didn't know anything about science, they didn't know anything about philosophy, they didn't know anything about theology. And therefore, the authors of scripture should not be believed when they talk about the cosmos, when they talk about nature, or when they talk about God, because they had naive and unlearned beliefs about these things. However, the authors of scripture had two distinguishing features. First of all, they were extremely morally upright individuals who had a very fine sense of good and what is right. And secondly, they had vivid imaginations. This is something that Spinoza takes over from Maimonides. Although, whereas Maimonides said that the prophets were also philosophically informed, Spinoza says, no, they were not. They didn't know philosophy. They had imagination. And that, combined with their moral character, allowed them to be inspiring storytellers. And that's why scripture is especially good at morally edifying its readers, moving us towards justice and charity. That's the message of scripture. 
But this is a message conveyed by very human writings, passed down through the generations, copied after copy after copy. And so what we probably have now is a rather corrupt document put together by an editor in the Second Temple period. And thus, the only sense in which it is divine is that it is especially good at moving people towards justice and charity. But if reading Shakespeare's King Lear, or Dickens' Hard Times, or Huckleberry Finn, if those books move you to justice and charity, then they are equally divine, because to be a divine book is just to be morally improving upon the reader. It's just that scripture does a very good job at that. Third thesis, Spinoza denies that Jewish law continues to be valid in the post-Second Temple period. Jewish law, he says, was imposed by a very wise set of lawgivers at a particular historical moment for a very particular political and historical purpose, uniting these tribes. And much of the halakha in the Torah is directed at worship in the temple. But with the destruction of the Jewish commonwealth and the destruction of the temple by the Romans, Jewish law has lost its raison d'etre. There's no longer any compelling reason to observe what he calls superstitious ceremonies. You see what's starting to may have, maybe have irritated um, the rabbis in the 17th century. <laughs> the fourth thesis is the denial of Jewish chosenness. Spinoza says there is no moral or metaphysical sense in which the Israelites or the Jewish people are God's chosen people. All human beings are equally a part of nature. So the metaphysical sense in which one human being can differ from another is nonsense. Every human being, just like giraffes and trees and dogs and cats, are all equally a part of nature in exactly the same way. So there's no metaphysical difference. There's also no moral difference. There are virtuous Jews and there are vicious Jews, just as there are virtuous Gentiles and vicious Gentiles. Morality is a matter of character and the practice of justice and charity, and there's no reason why any people are more or less gifted in this regard. The only sense, I was told I have 15 minutes, um, the only sense in which the Jews may have been chosen for is that they enjoyed a particularly long period of political good fortune because they had good laws and their kingdom was surrounded by tribes that didn't have the strength to overwhelm them. In other words, nature favored them, which is to say that there were natural causes why the political commonwealth lasted as long as it did. But with the end of the commonwealth, there's no longer a meaningful sense in which there's any kind of divine chosenness. That's the fourth thesis. The fifth thesis, uh, and I think this one was the particularly aggravating factor in the decision to ban Spinoza. Spinoza denies the personal immortality of the soul. He does say in the ethics that there is a sense in which the human mind has an eternal element. But that eternal element is just the fact that the more you know, the more you have in your mind pieces of eternal truths. So I know that one plus one equals two. Uh, I know the Pythagorean theorem. And I know a, a number of metaphysical and moral truths, which means that my mind has these contents that are eternal because these are eternal truths. But when I die, I'm gone. I'm dead. The truths that I, at some point, think of it as sort of a Wi-Fi system. There's this divine modem. With, with all due respect, um, there's a divine modem sort of broadcasting these truths throughout the cosmos, and to the extent that an individual embraces the tr these truths, they participate in eternity. But when you're dead, your personality is gone, although the truths will remain. Spinoza thinks that the personal immortality of the soul is an especially dangerous doctrine because it encourages one to live one's life in a state of hope and fear, hope for eternal reward and fear of eternal punishment. And the more you're governed by hope and fear, the more likely you are to submit yourself to ecclesiastical authorities who say, if you do this, you'll get to heaven. If you don't do that, you're going to hell. And that's a life of bondage, bondage to the passions. And Spinoza thought if we can eliminate the belief in the immortality, we've gone a long way towards mitigating and maybe even eliminating these superstitious and dangerous beliefs. The trouble is, uh, ordinarily, the doctrine of the immortality of the soul is a metaphysical and speculative issue. And throughout Jewish intellectual history, and you see a good number of rabbinic authorities who are very strongly committed to a doctrine of immortality, but you also see a number of rabbinic authorities who believe that the world to come is this life, and they refuse to speculate on the immortality of the soul. So ordinarily, it's the kind of philosophical issue, not a matter of halakha, not a matter of Jewish law, but a philosophical issue on which one is given a certain degree of latitude. 
However, Amsterdam in the mid-17th century was the wrong place and the wrong time to be denying the immortality of the soul. Each of the four rabbis, each of the four rabbis of this community had written a treatise defending and arguing for the immortality of the soul. And Spinoza knew that. So did Uriel de Costa, who was excommunicated, he says, for, similar, for also denying the immortality of the soul. Uh, secondly, I, I believe that the doctrine of immortality was especially important to these Portuguese Jews, given their background in the Catholic lands. There was still a good deal of Catholic doctrine that, I don't want to say infected, but that carried over into their religious beliefs. And one of the prominent, uh, most important dogmas of Catholicism is eternal reward in heaven, eternal punishment in hell, which require a strong belief in personal immortality. But also, the, the Portuguese Jews of Amsterdam were very concerned about the fate of their family members and relatives still in Spain and Portugal, living as Catholics. And there was a concern in the 17th century by these Portuguese Jews of what would be the eternal fate of these Jewish souls who, were deny, who had to at least publicly deny their Judaism. Um, it was also an important issue to the Dutch Calvinists, immortality. And it, it may have been that the excommunication of Spinoza was a way of saying to the Dutch, hey, look, we can keep our house clean. If there's somebody in our community who is denying doctrines that are important to you, the Calvinists, we'll take care of it. And so it might have been a very public act. Is there any evidence that Spinoza was saying any of these things in 1656? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. Uh, there are documents that uh, uh, I.S. Rivach discovered in the 1950s in the Inquisition's archives where travelers who were in Amsterdam uh, were interviewed when they returned back to Spain, and these travelers, independently of each other, said, yes, we, in fact, we met this man named Spinoza, and Spinoza said he was kicked out of the Jewish community uh, for saying that God exists only philosophically, the soul dies with the body, and the, and the law is no longer true. And this was in 1658 that these men were interviewed, fairly close to the excommunication in 1656. So if you ask me, and you have, um, <laughs> I think those are the reasons for the harem. Thank you. Yeah.